so this particular session wouldn't have happened without Sumina. She uh, suggested that somebody in the Open Hatch events community run a train the trainer session. And then I sort of was really hoping that somebody else would. And then it was like 20 minutes before the conference submission deadline. I was like, well, it'd probably be good if it happens. So I might as well submit it. Uh, so yeah, it's the first time that we've packaged up the training that we do for open source comes to campus events into anything formal. It's been very ad hoc until now. Um, you'll hear about events that have occurred over all the past three years. So, um, so there's sort of a lot of stuff that I had to think through and comb through and linearize in my brain, which also means that you guys are guinea pigs. If there's anything that isn't clear or that I should elaborate on, if there's things that if you were running one of these events that you would need to know, uh, you, if you tell me, then I will make it even better when I next talk to people. So I'll talk a little bit about myself again and about Open Hatch. This bird here, oh, it's blue. OK, I should just mind the cable. Uh, yeah, this, is, this bird's name is Sufyan. He's a baby penguin. Uh, his name is Sufyan for historical reasons. Originally on the website, the default profile photo was a photo of Sufyan Stevens. And then we decided to not violate copyright and also have something original. So uh, now the default profile photo is this penguin whose file name is still Sufyan. Uh, you'll see him around the website and the resources we publish. And as I said before, I work for Open Hatch, which is a nonprofit that I co-founded. We help people get involved in open source projects by running outreach events and maintaining web tools. And we work with programming user groups to make them more gender diverse and newcomer friendly. And for and I guess I'll end up talking about both of those. Um, we, are, we are a small organization, so if any of you work for companies that are so excited by what you see that you think, wow, we should really support this, we'd love to have your help. I'd love to talk to you about that. And the organization is a couple, well, Open Hatch refers to a couple things. It's the website that helps people find things to work on and helps people learn how to get started. It's this community of organizers of outreach events, and it's a formal nonprofit. In this talk, I'll be talking about the community of organizers. And my goal here is to talk about what I've learned so far, um, help you pick up from where I've left off and, we, and bring us all together. And as part of that, we have this, I'll talk more about how to run outreach events, even if they're not quite in the same vein. If they're not teaching undergrads to college students, that's fine. If there's still points of similarity that line up, then we'd love to have you on the events mailing list. We'd love to hear how your events went so that we can all learn how to run better events together. And one other thing worth knowing is that there's a lot of other great outreach talks going on today. Admittedly, two-thirds of these have me in them. But uh, Fiona Tay is talking about uh, her year of submitting pull requests in the, in the early afternoon. At 3.45, I, oh dear, I don't know if everyone who's on this panel. Um, <laughs> yeah, Valerie Aurora, Val is moderating the panel. Ash Dryden, myself, Sumana Hari uh and two-ish, I think, other people, and Lucas, one of whom, yes, good morning, uh, are all talking about the good news in, I think, mostly gender diversity, but not entirely gender diversity, in open source and free software. And uh, at 4.45, I'm giving a talk called Quantitative Community Management, which you've seen a variant of, but there's some new content. And that's about uh, how communities are tracking new contributors, how they're using surveys, and how to make sure that those line up with the goals the project actually has. Uh, in particular, I talk a bit about how to, uh, how to remove bias from opt-in surveys so that you can learn more by doing them. And yeah, so this is just my first talk uh, today and this year. <laughs> um, but I guess I've been to Open Source Bridge before. Hi. So the other really exciting thing going on today <coughs> is that PyLadies Portland and Open Hatch are collaborating on a submit your first patch to Open Source workshop at 7.30. At plain old seven. Great. And Flora is, that's Flora's brainchild. Selena, Flora, I, and probably Kenneth Wrights, and a few other people hopefully will be moderating and helping people um, submit patches and get past problems. So uh, in this, this talk, I'll talk about some history of how the open source comes to campus events got started. I'll talk about the laptop setup guides that we started using and why I think those are really important and show you one of those. Then we'll do something a bit more interesting interactively. I'll switch back to history. I'll tell you about the, uh, these interactive web-based tools called training missions and work through one of them with you. Then uh, I think around then I'll take a break because it'll have been an hour. And then I'll talk in more depth about the curriculum for these events 
and the logistics for how they work and what risks they have and how to mitigate those. And then, if there's t then hopefully there will still be time. We can have even more questions. And you can all work through, if you'd like, any of the particular lectures that you think you might want to give at a workshop. Actually, let me quickly ask, where are people based? Can I just get a city name? Right. Sorry? Red. Oh, oh, oh no, you're, what city are you based in? Uh, Napa. Cool. Portland. Yeah. Great. Portland. San Francisco. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we're planning on running an event kind of like this in February, no, the February of the fall semester. That's called October. In October, uh, uh, at Portland State. So it will be all. We don't know yet. Uh, we haven't, it depends on our travel schedule for the rest of the year, although if through some magic you all know exactly how these work, then maybe I don't even have to show up. Um, so yeah, um, I, I want to start in that history. Uh, some of you who know me probably know that I could really care about helping people be in control of their computing. And the first community teaching thing I did was in 2004 when I was a sophomore in college. It was a three-week break between the semesters, and I wanted to teach some of my friends and some people I didn't know how to write web scraping code in Python so they could take websites that had information they wanted and automate it somehow. And I taught that uh, even to some people who weren't even weren't programmers yet. Uh, in 2009, I had long, somewhat long since graduated college, and I founded Open Hatch as a for-profit startup. And our plan, our plan was to revolutionize how companies find programmers by creating a community website for open source developers, attracting the experienced contributors to the site and matching them through what we know about them and their work with paid job positions and uh, revolutionizing how money something open source something. Anyway, uh, it didn't work out, as you can somewhat infer. Uh, and by the summer of 2010, my other two co-founders had both wandered off to do other things. One of them went back to law school, and the other one started a philosophy PhD program at Princeton. So that left me, and it was pretty clear that we weren't going to make any millions of dollars for anyone. I was living in Philadelphia at the time, though, and I organized a meetup for fans of free and open source software at a random Indian restaurant near my house. And uh, we got like six or eight people, which I was pretty pleased by. And one of them practically begged me to come to the University of Pennsylvania and teach his classmates how open source works, since he just felt like students didn't know the first thing. And I was just like, it's 2009. I remember being shocked by this in 2002. But I guess they still don't. So yeah, I can do that. But I kind of think that if I just give a one hour lecture, it'll be really exciting. And then people will wander off. and things won't quite stick. So what I really wanted to do was to make it a full weekend workshop, help people not just understand how free software and open source work, and how communities work, and how bug trackers and mailing lists and version control work, but also get experience submitting their first patch to something. So it felt like communities were really inviting them. So uh, he said yes, and then he, Felice Ford, and I committed to make that first workshop happen. So that was sort of the seed of what I now think of as Open Hatch version 2 of the nonprofit. And uh, we asked students, well, so now I have to run this thing anyway. Uh, we did some sign-ups by email. Um, we just emailed the computer science undergrad list with a few questions about how, uh, well, with these questions. How they discovered the event website. Oh, I guess. Good, yeah, yeah, OK. How they discovered the event website, their degree, degree of involvement. and. I just love these super enthusiastic students that say things like this. Um, it really uh, is a huge part of why I keep doing things like this. So uh, what we ended up doing, well, I was sort of expecting us to get about 20 signups, and we got 51. So we uh, had this really long session by email. Sorry, we, we, we had all these emails uh, that students have sent us with the answers to these questions. And I guess we put them in a spreadsheet somewhere, and UV, Felice, and I electronically sort of ranked them by how enthusiastic they seemed. And then we picked the top 30 and sent those 30 an email. <laughs> and uh, so obviously, this person did, in fact, show up. Uh, this oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so 
I tried to offer people a spectrum of answers uh -huh. so they could like get a sense. <laughs> In case, I don't know. Maybe we run into somebody. <laughs> Although I hear it's hard to have written most of it nowadays. So there's like dozens of contributors practically. So, well, yeah. <laughs> Um, so we spent, uh, UV and I in particular, spent a bunch of time planning the curriculum. And there was some friction between helping people get excited about being users of open source and being exposed to lots of different pieces of software that they could use. Hello. And um, so I was actually originally kind of excited about showing people how to set up, how to set up things like networking because networking my parents' house was how I got into Linux in the first place. But we ended up... Uh, we ended up focusing on aspects of free software that mattered sort of were very general and broad on the Saturday teaching day, and then on the second day, focusing on just having them dive into working on specific open source projects. Uh, and we wanted a combination of these different teaching workshops. So I'll show you. This is what the opening looked like. Um, and I don't know if you can see uh, the little Ubuntu logo here because police decided to encourage people in the morning as they were setting up their computers from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. If they have Windows but wanted to switch to Ubuntu, now's a great time. I was kind of stressed out and running around like, uh, like my hair was on fire from 9 to 10. And so I'd, in hindsight, uh, it seems like, a lot of, like some non-zero number of people saw this, grabbed an Ubuntu CD, installed it between 9 and 10, and then used Ubuntu for the rest of the day. And I'm, that's, I guess installing Linux works now. That's cool. I kind of didn't know that. <laughs> Although I'm a Debian developer, so you'd think I would know that. Uh, but anyway, so we, we wanted this combination of teaching workshops. And so we settled on this format where in the first, on the first day of the Saturday, the teaching day, we had students rotate between four modules. And what that meant for us was we split the students up into four groups basically randomly. I think based on where they were seated uh, during the opening session in the morning. And um, so we had about six or seven students uh, in, a, in each of a different room for an hour at a time working with an instructor to work through any of the following four modules. And so um, students would get up and rotate at the end of the hour to the next room where an instructor who knew a particular module uh, would greet them and then teach them that. So these are the modules that we focused on. Um, the idea here, like I said, is to, was to take people who sort of knew how to use computers but who hadn't been exposed to collaborative communities of programming at all and show them what they need to know. We ran into some difficulties with this. Uh, um, so, let me see, yeah. Um, so, let me tell you what didn't work about this. Uh, so first of all, we sort of, because people were, sorry, do you have a question about the structure here? Or? Oh, no. Okay. Um, so one fun thing, uh, fun and scare quotes that happened, was that if you have a command line skills workshop last, but you have, uh, if you're randomly selected to have, to show up to the how to download and build open source software session first, and then you're like, how to use IRC, and then you're like, uh, how to use bug trackers, and then you're like, how to use the command line? Well, you probably should have known that first. You probably should have, it probably would have helped you to know how to use CD and LS and those sorts of things first. Um, the students at, and so like, I don't know, of the 30 ish students, probably five to 10 or so had very, very minimal command line experience. Um, so that was kind of a drag. Um, but uh, by and large, I think people got a lot out of it. And we had some sponsorships from Pragmatic Programmer and O'Reilly, so we can hand out some door prizes. Plus, GitHub and Bitbucket let us hand out randomly raffling. Uh, no, the, the, for those, we could give to everybody a free student premium subscription for a year. Well, I think now there's, you can do that on their website. Um, so just to round out the, the image of what happened on Sunday, to add that, pe many people showed back up, although far from everyone, and worked on projects of various kinds. Um, so let me tell you more of what didn't work. 
Uh, first of all, we didn't prepare our teachers well enough, which is part of why I'm pleased to be here doing this. Um, in particular, we, like, we told them which module we, I wanted them to teach and gave them sort of a paragraph description of it a few days before the event and then sort of said, go. And then they didn't have any way to, they didn't know each other necessarily. They didn't know who was teaching the other sessions. They uh, didn't know what items would be covered in each session necessarily with great detail. And so that means that we had this dependency problem, like I said before. Uh, and it also meant that our teaching assistants who were, you know, so we tried to structure it so that the teaching workshops in an hour was half lecture and then half interactive exercises. We found that in some cases, the lecturers had less to say than half an hour. And in other cases, the lecturers had what should have taken half an hour to say, but at, they sort of had to figure it out the first time they gave it. So it took 45 minutes the first time, then there wasn't enough time for the interactive stuff. Uh, and then by the end of it, uh, people totally were smoothed out and figured out how long to say things for. But now like 25% of the students got a great experience. Or rather, rather 25% of each workshop, each module was a great experience. The other thing is that um, we had a teacher and a TA in every room, and during the interactive portion, TAs weren't, in my opinion, aggressive enough about asking people, hey, do you need help? And so we'll, uh, I'll put you all through something soon that'll help you know what I mean more clearly. And um, another, another interesting thing was that one student came to me during the ethics and, ethics and history of free software session and said, hey, I'm super excited about, uh, about this free software thing. I totally get it. It's really important. But I noticed tomorrow is this hackathon, and it sounds very exclusive. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess the word hack can sound kind of maybe exclusive or maybe illicit. Uh, I've spent enough time reading like my corner of the web and the internet where it sounds perfectly normal. But that's not necessarily the best way to introduce people. So uh, later on, Jessica McKellar and I, who I worked with on a different workshop, came up with the phrase project's time or project night, which seems more gentle and also adequately precise. So we also didn't focus enough on making the Saturday project's time be really great. And here are a couple ways we uh, could have done better. So first of all, one big thing was that one of the uh, one of the staffers was really excited about getting students to work with him on building some particular Android project from scratch that he thought would be super cool. And basically that meant the, those students who flocked to him in like, like eight of them or so spent about an hour talking with him about what he was imagining. Um, they're not people with a lot of experience taking you know, a description of a program, turning it into wireframes, turning that into UI elements, and turning that into code. They instead like, tried to install the Android SDK and sort of got stuck. And uh, what I wanted them to get was a sense that existing open source projects have places to plug in. So we could have exercised some more discretion there. And the other thing was that I, while I did come up with a list of what I thought were good bite-sized bugs in various open source projects, uh, what I didn't do was test setting up the development environment for those projects, which, depending on your platform or depending on your experience level, can be harrowing. And there was one experience where a student wanted, really wanted to work on Sugar Labs, which is the operating system behind OPC, and, well, laptop per child, that is. And um, luckily, Sugar Labs has some super clear instructions on their website for how to get the system going. If you're on a Mac, you're, if you have VirtualBox, you are great. If you don't, you just download it, and then you run the virtual machine image, and it should come up with this Sugar desktop and then you can use their instructions to edit the code files and submit a patch. But uh, in the instructions on the wiki, there's this one checkbox you have to check that's like for the kind of hardware you're supposed to emulate in VirtualBox. And that, that checkbox on her VirtualBox install was just grayed out. I couldn't figure out why. Uh, she was really excited because she'd just been to a talk by Walter Bender. And Walter Bender had talked about how amazingly great distributing educational computers to students all over the world is. Um, and I was like, that was an issue that I don't know if I could have really known ahead of time, but we could have picked something that didn't require such a setup process as her first thing. So that she would get like the sense of submitting a patch to something, and then after that, try the more risky thing. 
Uh, another thing is we didn't focus on getting boobs. Oh. The things that I thought were going to happen aren't happening, I think. Interesting. I wonder how this works. Oh, I saw something. Uh, there's a free split. Interesting. Something that said Oh, also interesting. Uh, one second. Mm, kind of. Let's see what happens when I reload. I'm, uh, well, this this problem is entirely mine. There we are. Great. I mean, it's not like I wrote this software, but relatively few people in the world use it. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, I'm out of sync here. Oh, I know what I should do. I'm going to do one more thing. Am I? We'll see. Uh, it's this thing called reveal.io. I, like, found out about it. Uh, five months ago, and then I used it to make my slides for LCA, and it worked out approximately great there. But see, look, it's my presenter console. All right, sweet. Uh, I'll take that over here. You all can keep this again. Great. Uh, oh, I think the presenter console is broken if the bullets auto don't auto advance. I should file a bug. I'll write that up. One sec. <laughs> uh, Yep. I wanted to have a picture of, of a tux penguin inside of a tux penguin to demonstrate why I think that's a bad plan. Yeah. 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 I guess that's one way to do it. For me, I'm really excited about people leaving with the development environment on their own computer. So you can't, I mean, basically because they're probably going to need help setting up their development environment. So if you can help them while they're there, great. And otherwise, they probably can't set it up at all. But then you like reboot into a different operating system in order to do your development. I mean, so uh, it's a bit of an aside, but I guess I'll totally take this right now. Um, two years ago, I heard there was this amazing new tool called Vagrant from somebody here at Open Source Bridge. And I was like, let me, I found him and said, let me tell you why I hate your idea. And he said, OK, uh, so here are the reasons. Uh, first of all, if you have an uh, underpowered machine, then running like Vagrant up and have a spinning up virtual box will chew up all your RAM and you can't do any work. Secondly, with most virtual machine things, you have to use the text editor inside, like, inside a virtual computer that's not your personal text editor. And he said, don't worry. With Vagrant, you just share a folder, and you can use your regular text editor on your regular operating system. I was like, OK, that's not as bad. Um, and so I fiddled with it a little. I tried uh, the OpenHatch website is a Django app with a bunch of dependencies. So I thought, OK, people have definitely had trouble installing this, running this in a development environment, especially on Windows. Uh, so the great thing about Vagrant is it provides the very same virtualized Linux install. And you just write these simple puppet manifests to describe how to install all the dependencies. Uh, what could be simpler? So then I spent a week learning Puppet and making these manifests. And then uh, I, but before I could even do that, on my Debian desktop, I tried to install Vagrant. And I got this amazing error where the Ruby, uh, VirtualBox, sorry, Vagrant is written in Ruby. And in order for Vagrant to spin up a virtual machine, it needs to be connected to VirtualBox through a C binding to Ruby that speaks to the VirtualBox daemon that's automatically run when you run VirtualBox. And VirtualBox has a headless mode, so it can run this daemon automatically for you in the background. This sounds super simple, right? And uh, what could be more reliable? So it turned out that I compiled and installed this Ruby library by the instructions, and then Ruby couldn't find it. And I was like, 
I can sign on to IRC and get this fixed, and it seems to be an upstream issue. But like, people who are new to web programming aren't going to show up and be like, the problem is your C flags when you compile your Ruby C extension, <laughs> which I can say. So anyway, we f they fixed that bug, and then I tried Vagrant more, uh, and I spent like a week, like, you know, uh, yak shaving very fine the the shaved yak of these these descriptions of how to run a virtual Debian computer so that on my Debian computer I could have a virtual machine in which to run this app. And then I was like, why don't I just throw away all of this uh, after watching a Windows user try to install Vagrant and have him spend like an hour downloading VirtualBox, setting it up, trying to install Ruby, me being like stressed out when he couldn't get Ruby working on Windows just so that he could run Python inside a virtual Linux system. I know how to install Python on Windows. It's like you download this thing and you click next a bunch. Uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it wasn't convincing. So what we ended up doing was, uh, what I ended, basically, Vagrant is a way of outsourcing the problem of setting up the development environment to this third-party tool with its own pluses and minuses. And if your app really needs all this complexity, then maybe it's essential. Uh, or if you're in a sort of very limited environment where you basically are in personal contact with all the people who will need help fixing Vagrant, then that's great. But otherwise, what we did was just shave off parts of the OpenHatch website that required stuff that was hard to install, make that optional, and uh, bundle all the dependencies inside the code repository. And this is a hilarious thing for me to do as a Debian developer, because we're like basically honor sworn to never embed copies of code in anything. And uh, now you just clone the, Py the Git repo for OpenHatch, and you install Python, and you run Python managed py SQL something, Python managed py run server. You don't edit any files. You don't compile anything with a C compiler that you had to go install. Yeah. So. Uh, is this, I'm curious if this story is about the Sahana thing at Grace Hopper two issues yeah, ago. That's the place where we were like, oh yeah, virtual box. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then people showed up because it's like forbidden and they just came to show up to the virtual box. Yes. 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 Oh my goodness. Sorry. It's just like, there are so many ways um, for it to be hard. They were divided up into hours. Yeah. Uh, it depends. How's that for an answer? So, because <laughs> I'm never sure if an hour is enough time or if it's too much time, or is especially for the project. Yeah. Well, for the I modules, right? Going back to like side, because I was just essentially taking notes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this thing. Yeah. Um, so an hour was a, a total guess, um, and. Basically, I think that it was too much time if the presenters were prepared, and uh, just barely too little time for the first time they did it. Um, for different follow-up events, what we've done, hi, by the way. Uh, no worries. For, for other follow-up events, I noticed that the instructors would get faster, so I actually scheduled the time periods to decrease, and to my shock, that worked great. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but now that we've written out more of the teaching material, it should be easier for people to practice and just know how long it'll take. And how long it'll take for most of these things is about 45, 30 to 45 minutes, depending. Um, yeah, I just like get really disappointed when people are trying to contribute to my project and they can't install random other people's things that I know how to fix, but I know they don't know how to fix. So, um, yeah, development environments. Uh, the other thing we didn't think about enough is, by the way, uh, just to briefly fill you in, this is sort of uh, post-mortem on how, this particular moment is a post-mortem on how the first open source comes to campus event worked, and we'll talk more about how they were modified after that. Um, sure. Uh, the other thing is, I didn't think much about how to keep students active and engaged in open source after this flashy two-day event. I mean, 
part of the point of having it be two days long was that they could like move on into things on their own. But um, what ended up happening was UV, who's the one of the two people who invited me, uh, emailed the attendee mailing list and said like, hey, let's all get together and do something. And he scheduled an Ubuntu release party because Ubuntu was being the new version of Ubuntu was being released shortly after this event. Um, and then there wasn't really consensus on what other events to run after that, and so the group kind of fizzled out. And in hindsight, like, if we had found some existing student group to piggyback onto, we, UV wouldn't have sort of been staring at his email being like, why is no one deciding on what to run? All these ideas sound good. Somebody should just pick one. Somebody would have just picked one who's whoever's responsible for running the club. So, uh, and as I said earlier, we, our TAs really could have been more uh, insistent on asking people for help when they looked stuck. We, uh, let me show you my favorite photo from this event. And uh, it's my favorite photo because it shows a bunch of men standing around wasting time chatting while uh, the real technical people are doing things like setting up their compilers. I mean, it's not like a very deep statement, it's just a photo I like. But uh, I, there is one other positive angle of this event which I didn't touch on yet, which is gender diversity. So one of the famous concerns in free software is the lack of women in the community compared to, for example, the proprietary software community or, for example, the planet. And I think that a lot of that is because of a dearth of effective role models, social, a lack of social support among peers. If people generally socialize with people who look like them, then dudes are more likely to have friends who work in open source. And I think that even just hearing about open source in a way that encourages you to participate is still fairly uncommon, given that people still invite us to run these workshops. And uh, but even these theories aside, I wanted to make sure that the results we got were a fairly diverse group of attendees, at least gender-wise. So I was all set before the event uh, to send special emails to women in CS groups, to find professors, to ping individual students. Um, but I did the simplest thing that could possibly work first before I got it going on that, which is I just had UV email the computer science uh, department head to email all these CS undergrads at Penn and say, hey, there's this event. Uh, we'd love if you would sign up. And a little over 30% of our signups of those 51 were women. I guess it's probably 18 of them because that would be 50, they're 34%. Anyway, uh, and, well, and when I say were women, I mean had female looking names. And um, then again, when we sorted people by enthusiasm, we got about the same percentage. So then I didn't end up having to do any kind of gender oriented specific outreach at all. And I think that has to do with two things about the workshop. First is that we, uh, first is that the computer science department at Penn just is more diverse than your average computer science department. Uh, I th and um, to go on a brief aside again, maybe, uh, Penn's computer science department is split into two groups. There's computer science, and then there's all of computer science, but also design and graphics stuff. And that second thing is called digital media design. And the gender diversity in plain old CS is probably like 15-ish percent women, and the gender diversity in DMD is like 40-ish, 50-ish percent women. So a lot of our women came from DMD, which is great by me. Uh, I, I, quickly, I did briefly chat with, uh, with Susan Davidson, who runs the department, and she didn't say that they do that. Um, yeah. But I mean, I think, I kind of think that, my guess is they probably don't switch out of DMD much because there's, you're not missing out on anything. You're just doing a lot more work. <laughs> and the parts where you're doing more work are presumably things that you cared about in the beginning. So, um, the, but the other angle though is that the workshop does, the, the, the web page for the workshop and the emails for the workshop do say, uh, it's, a, it's an educational opportunity. We're looking to teach you. We're looking to invite newcomers. It doesn't say you have to be the awesomest thing and you must, like, I don't know, chop your competitors' legs off in order to win the grand prize at this contest. So, yeah. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, there is a great online video of uh, a mock actual ninja attempting to interview at a software company and then flipping out and killing everyone. But anyway, <laughs> so that's sort of how that event worked. Um, and I learned a bunch from it, as you can see. Uh, mostly, though, I got the sense that 
there were ways I needed to improve that I couldn't quite figure out how to improve yet. So that was when I learned, I, I took a moment to learn about other outreach workshops that have succeeded in some of the ways that this didn't work. And the particular way that I was most concerned about was the retention question. Because like UV, I was sort of staring at the attendees mailing list and being like, please run an event. Now I've moved to Boston, like I can't even go and help you. But like, you just have to like show up to things and do them, it'll be fun. Uh, so while reading about the, the competition, in a way, other similar workshops, some of you may know this slide, it's from Sarah May's talk about RailsBridge at Southern California Linux Expo in 2010. And this is the state of how the San Francisco Ruby Users Group, sorry, I think February 2009. This is, we'll all find out soon when the next slide comes up. Uh, anyway, and right, it looks, it is what it looks like. Uh, by 2% women, what Sarah May meant was that it was just she and Sarah Allen and 98 dudes at this Ruby on Rails meetup group in San Francisco. And that wasn't that exciting. Uh, the exciting thing was that after a year of running newcomer-oriented workshops, and as part of the user group, they got the gender diversity ratio to, to improve. And I was like, ah, running the events as part of an existing group. Maybe that means that UV wouldn't have to like ping the mailing list all the time, hoping that people would put events together. He could just like relax, be a grad student, and go to events. Uh, and it also meant that the attendees had some kind of social, would, the attendees of the SF Ruby meetup, when they meet through a diversity oriented event, have some social context in which to meet each other again uh, and in which to get to know other more advanced people. Um, but I wasn't quite sure this would work. Um, it's just this one study, one case really. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try to clone this in Boston and see how that works. And uh, some of you may already know how that story goes. Uh, it begins with me showing up at the Boston Python user group January 2011. So I just moved to Boston, as I said, and Ned Batchelder was inviting all the speakers who had, were accepted to speak at PyCon to give preview versions of their talk at the Boston Python group. And I was already planning on giving a talk about gender diversity and outreach, uh, a talk that at least Lucas, I think, saw. And, and uh, I hadn't been to a Boston Python user group meeting yet, but now I was invited to speak at one. And uh, as I was prepping my slides, I had this hidden agenda, which was I want to convince Ned not only that my talk was at least kind of okay, but also that I should run an event as part of his user group that I haven't showed up at except to brainwash them. <laughs> but let's see how that worked. So anyway, he was like, I, I, was just, I just like gave this like rambly talk about RailsBridge and a bunch of other lovely things. I think there's a photo of a cake somewhere in that talk also. And Ned was, I was like, Ned, what if we run something like RailsBridge in the Boston Python group? He was like, sure. Well, that was super easy, easier than I thought. So uh, now I had to, though, because I had only two months before PyCon. I wanted to talk about it at PyCon. So I got together a group of uh, prospective staffers to like, have lunch and talk about how the event would look and wh where I was coming from, what I had learned from RailsBridge. Uh, I copied the RailsBridge laptop setup guide. So they have this. They had, and they've modified it since, but they have this just like wonderful list of things you need to do to make your computer ready to run Ruby on Rails. And they dedicate three hours for on the day before the main teaching part of the, the event so that people have plenty of time to get the computer set up. Uh, I think you basically need a C compiler in order to use Ruby on a Mac, uh, all these things. But they wrote it up, and they just leave students through it. So I copied that, divided by Ruby, multiplied by Python, and put that on the Open Hatch wiki. Uh, and Jessica and I built teaching material that we tried to really play test. Um, a lot of our play testing happened by having the other staffers just like work through the exercises that we had written. Um, but this meant that we had to really think through what we wanted to get taught, and so we had it written up on the wiki, and we had a sense of how long it would take, which addresses the one hour question. Um, there were definitely some things that weren't as well tested as I thought they were, uh, and we plus other contributors uh, smooth some of that out later. And of course, we had retention built into the event. So Jessica and I didn't have to do all the work after the event. Yeah, so here's how it works. Uh, we run the Boston Python workshop for women and their friends. And then we invite people to these open project nights. See, we renamed it. And uh, 
people just sort of show up and work on whatever they want. Plus, we have a little web page that suggests what they can work on. Um, they become user group regulars, and then they take over the world. But yeah. Uh, so the Boston Python user group hadn't actually run any newcomer friendly, open, work on what you want evening events. They are always like, how do you, what's, what are the five best ways to implement concurrency when you're deploying at web scale and have exceeded Heroku's capacity, learn from Eventbrite or whatever. And uh, those aren't necessarily exciting to newcomers. <laughs> so, um, and Ned was actually really enthusiastic about changing the way the group worked, which was so great to work with. But we still didn't do everything perfectly. Uh, the big thing that we could have done differently uh, is, our, is if there were a handful of things in our staffers. Uh, first of all, so let me ask you guys this question. How many of you feel comfortable, feel like Windows is your native platform and you can do anything you want to there? OK. Uh, can, do you know how to copy and paste from the Windows command prompt? Oh, OK, cool. Awesome. Uh, wow, that's a larger fraction than our, at our Boston Python workshop staff. Uh, and <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> that is something so important. I will show it to you in a second. And uh, the other thing, though, is just the staffers weren't as aggressive about you know grabbing people and being like, "Hey, let me help you. Uh, what do you need help with?" So. Uh, That, I guess, is the conclusion I'm drawing. Uh, so, um, so let me now, in a fresh section, give you a quick tour of how those laptop setup guides look. And this is the part where uh, split, having two screens makes life very interesting. Oh dear, I hope my browser history isn't going to be awful. Uh, No. <laughs> uh, OK. So blah, 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 text. Uh, the way the laptop setup guides look is they're just a very simple wiki page that have a number of goals. I'm logged in, so there's these edit links. Uh, we have had students fix up the laptop setup guide during the events. The wiki, uh, the open hatch wiki lets anyone edit it. We, just have, we have some reasonably good anti-spam that I set up. Uh, and you click on your platform, and you go forward. And on Windows, we discovered things like uh, it's not actually as easy as clicking next because you have to add Python to your percent path percent. But now we write about that. Uh, we tell you how to use a text editor. Many of the Boston Python workshop attendees didn't have a text editor. We tell you how to start and exit the Python interpreter. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to see new people typing bash commands into a Python prompt and like getting name errors. Being like CD, but I just did that. What's wrong? Um, so that's the thing you want to look for. Uh, and they figure it out quick, but you have to tell them basically to save them like 10 minutes of their lives to use for something else. Uh, yep, so you run some Python code from a file, and these all go to sub pages. I'll click on this one again. Uh, actually, let's look at dependencies. I love installing software, but not everyone does. So we made it really easy. Uh, I'll close the install Python tab and show you how to install all the dependencies for. Friday on Windows. Oh, sorry, for the Saturday projects on Windows. Um, this is kind of the alternative to giving everyone a virtual machine. You excite them about how it'll look, and then you just tell them to do what you would do, which is download some zip file, unzip it, CD into the directory, uh, run Python, and make sure that it works. And we get, for, for I know I'm taking a bit of an aside from the Open Source Comes to Campus events, but at the Boston Python workshop for women and their friends, we get a lot of people who don't have much experience with the command line at all, who've actually never opened the terminal, never used it at all. And uh, reliably, they seem to really enjoy being told how to use terminal commands and getting a sense of that. Uh, Go ahead, and then I'll talk to Sarah. Uh, And then you can have like a workshop the weekend before and say, hey, here's an intro to this before you do the whole project again, or? Well, we, we do, we sort of target it at newcomers anyway, and I'm kind of unenthusiastic about making the sign-up form very long. 
Um, plus, we do the sign-up integrated with the Boston Python user groups meetup. So there's, I guess you can ask some questions there, but it, I don't know. I guess I don't find the UI super thrilling. Um, in this case, I'm somewhat surprised to report that more information wouldn't improve, improve outcomes. Like, we'd have everyone show up on Friday. It's mandatory. If you think you have everything installed, you're probably wrong anyway, because you need to install this, these random balls of code. You might not know quite everything we wanted to teach you. Um, and if you're new, three hours is still enough time to get through it. <coughs> so. Yeah. How did that work out for gender diversity? Did you have people like say, oh, I have to find a woman to bring with me? Or did you just have friends and guys show up? Or? So uh, that phrase, the women and their friends phrase, is copied from RailsBridge. And it, in their case, refers to women are invited, and they can bring a non-woman as their plus one. Right. And um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So in our case, uh, all, I think for the first workshop, 100%, all, I think there was one dude there, and the rest were women. Um, also, uh, and if any of you are concerned that you couldn't fill up an event like this in your city, just so you know, the first one filled up in three days, the second one filled up in like 25 hours, the third one filled up in 13 hours, don't worry, you'll be fine. Um, and yeah, exactly. Yeah? I went to a Railsbridge workshop in San Francisco before we were starting the WordPress workshop. So I yeah. could see what they were doing. And um, they kind of run multiple workshops at a time. And they do yes. like beginner Mac, beginner Windows, intermediate Mac, intermediate Windows, which is awesome. But since we were starting like this whole series, I'm like, well, I'm going to go super beginner Mac and just see what they do. So I was kind of down a level, um, which means I didn't get as much out of it personally. But as someone who's been in the training program, that was kind of what I wanted. And I was kind of horrified that in the beginner math session, we had four women students, three male teachers, and a male plus one because of women and their friends. And it was one of the women's husbands, and he was a Rails developer. So it was a room full of men um, teaching the women. The teacher was not familiar with the curriculum. All of the students were. We had all read it online. Um, one of the TAs was very familiar with it, but the teacher wasn't letting him say, actually, we should be doing this. After about 20 minutes of the teacher telling us um, the history of rail, one woman said, are, are we going to build this voting app? Because that's what the curriculum is. He was like, oh, no, we're not going to have time for that. We have to get through all this prep work first. And then everyone was basically like, no, we're supposed to build this voting app. And if we don't finish, that's fine. But we should actually be able to. It's not that hard. And the yeah. like, yeah, everyone I've been to in Seattle, you know, we get through it in the beginner workshop. And meanwhile, the woman is turning to her husband instead of to the other woman. And it was actually a kind of disheartening process. And Sorry to hear that. that um, we don't do and friends for the uh, WordPress ones. It's just women um, because that way they don't get distracted by sort of the males in the room. And we've also experimented with having all women teachers and having mixed gender teachers. And even though the men that we have as teachers are super awesome and like people love them, I've definitely noticed a difference in terms of kind of how open are with what they don't know when it's all women and also their willingness to kind of share their personal experiences and why they haven't done this stuff on their own before. So we're pretty much going for, for the women specific workshop. It's all women. In the Boston Python workshops case, we always have, cool, thanks. We always have the lead instructor for each uh, breakout group for the projects be a woman. Maybe there's a male TA or maybe not. And we have very few dudes. I was sort of chuckling at your question before, because in the, first, in the first or the second workshop, a couple of dudes on Meetup were like, wow, this sounds great. What an opportunity. Is it possible for me to attend? And I'm like, and uh, <laughs> Jessica McKellar was like, what do we do with these people? You deal with them. And so I said, uh, I just replied to the Meetup saying, sorry, uh, this, meet, this event is for women and their friends only, so you can, you can join us if you can find if there's a woman who's attending who you know who is willing to invite you as her plus one. Uh, and my favorite part, though, of replying is saying, but this event is part of the Boston Python user group as a whole, and we have lots of open educational events. So if this work event doesn't work out for you, just come to our project night in a few weeks. And then it's like not a pain for them. 
Um, but yeah, it's feel free to not bother. Um, so uh, this is how this is how our uh, setup works. Um, you just like run some commands, and people love it. Um, and the commands are basically the same across Windows and Mac and Linux. And maybe you're thinking, how can they be the same when Windows uses DAR instead of LS? And this is the part where I unfreeze a virtual machine and show it to you. All right, welcome to Windows. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. Uh, I just unpaused this VM, so it might take a second to swap in its existence. Uh, uh, grab input. Sweet. All right. Oh, wait, I need to resize it. Sorry. Um, so anyway, the answer for how you can have the same commands work on Windows, Mac, and Linux is I think something RailBridge does also still, and certainly something we did before. Uh, I want to resize it. Where's the resize button? All right, I'll zoom, but it'll look terrible. Ack. Ack. I'll zoom to fit, because the, where's the start button? I, OK, yeah. Uh, cool. So when you install Git, you get this thing called Git Bash. And Git Bash is the best. It is, you're like, oh man, I'm on Windows. How do I get wget? Oh wait, actually, never mind. I'm on Windows. How do I get curl? There I go. Uh, uh, I'm on Windows. I have to dr, right? Nope. You get to ls. So good. PLED. Uh, so it's a Unixified path. This is using the minimal GNU tools for Windows, MinGW32. Um, it's pretty simple and doesn't sort of take over your command prompt world in the same way that Sigwin does for those who've used Sigwin. Um, the, best thing, the best thing about it isn't just that Git is around. Uh, it's that like, you can CD and LS. So that's cool. But how do you copy paste? Anyone know how to copy paste in the Windows command prompt? Well, you can't just like, drag the mouse over things uh, like you could in GNOME terminal or something. And there's no menu, so that's not going to work. Oh, wait. Wait, why is that why is my mouse going away? I wanted that mouse. Anyway, but there is a secret menu. If you click in this icon here, uh, and you click on Edit, and then you click on Mark, you can drag the cursor around. Uh, oh, wait one sec. Uh, it works better when I have a mouse. I don't know where my mouse went. Anyway, whatever. Oh, OK, OK. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, OK, so maybe I can't use Windows either. Hi. Um, anyway, what's supposed to happen when, my, when I can click correctly is that it'll like highlight that, and then you click that, edit, copy, and then that region gets copied to the clipboard. And it's super cool. It's like Emacs is rectangular select for those of you who know about that feature. But it means that any text you copy gets trailing white space appended to it, which is not quite awesome. But it's what we have. So anyway, that's how you use Windows. I hope you've enjoyed this interlude. Where did my browser go? I see. Oh, thanks. I really am not very good at keeping a web browser open today. Oh, maybe it crashed. OK, that's fine. See if I care. Uh, one sec. Uh, the birthday cake was, I think, store bought, but it was for my cousin. I took a nice photo of it like four years ago, I guess. Uh, slid eyes. Yes. Sorry about that. Wahoo. Yeah, so that's how laptop setup guides work, and that's how Windows works. Uh, so I'd like to do a brief exercise with you all. Can I get four volunteers, preferably who have computers, actually? 
one, two. You won't have to do out of juice. You won't have to do anything very complicated. Three. Four. Awesome. Okay. So if you're on one of these four. That's fine. Uh, I think I numbered you one, two, three, four. You'll need your number. Um, go to smarturl.it slash stuck. So, uh, so uh, in this exercise, what I want to do is pretend that uh, we're in an open source comes to campus workshop, that we're students are learning how to use diff and patch, and we are, with the rest of us, well, for now, I'm a TA, and soon we'll do it with all of you are TAs. And I want you to see what it looks like when you interrupt someone who needs help. So first of all, so the way the story goes is that these four people are all learning, going through the, the Open Hash training mission for Patch, which is a web page that teaches you these things interactively. And um, one of them, uh, in her case, w is progressing just fine. Um, how are you, are you, are you four at the web page here yet? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and you know, it's an entirely simulated session, but what I want to show you is why it's important to ask people for help directly rather than just tell people to raise their hands if they need help. So, uh, you, uh, how are you all, four of you, how are you doing? Do you need any help? Uh, what? That's out of character, isn't it? What's going on? Let's see. <laughs> okay. No, no. I'm, I'm just simulating being ch the challenge. You don't ask people if anyone needs help. We will say, does, does, if your screen doesn't look like this, please raise your hand so it's mm. Awesome. We try to keep it very specific and kind of stop frequently enough that no one can get behind. That makes sense. For some of the stuff, uh, the way that we've revised currently some of the, the, these like one hour modules, there's like 20 minutes of lecture and then 15 to 20 minutes of self driven exercises. So, at the way ours are currently, it's hard to state how the screens should look, but it's probably possible to get really creative and adjust it to that. Um, Uh, so, if any of you need any help, raise your hands. I guess I should have prepped the fake students in the Teaching the Teachers workshop about Teaching the Teachers that talks about how the TAs need to be prepped so that the demo will go more smoothly. Um, but anyway. I know. <laughs> Maximum stack depth exceeded. Uh, what, we, what I do often is, walk, uh, as a TA, is walk around and look at people's screens. Um, and my general notion here, crazy or not, is oh, that. I'm supposed to be surfing Facebook. That's what my directions are. Great, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to have a red number. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so, hey, uh, do you need help with anything? Uh, Okay. How do, you, how do you log into Open Hash? Oh, so you've logged in here, <laughs> but uh, when you log in, it takes you to the home page. So I guess you need to go back, actually back to the page that you were starting on. Okay. Um, maybe tomorrow or later today, we should file a bug so that doesn't happen. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> What's your error message? So what Lucas just told me is that she's duck-duck-going her error message. Uh, she's 
typing an op she's typing the patch command in with patch space hyphen hyphen p0. Um, so uh, here, the way it looks is that you just need to pass one hyphen to the p, and it looks like you have two. And as someone with experience in this stuff, I'm familiar that short options like that only take one hyphen. Cool. Um, I guess we're telling people to run commands they haven't run before, often in a command prompt they haven't used before. So uh, they will run into all sorts of situations where they think they've copied things correctly. And I really value the screen watching. Uh, so to do that, I, to demonstrate this again, I want everyone, if possible, to pair up with somebody who is near a laptop. And you're all going to, so the one with the laptop, whack, yeah, OK. The one with the laptop should go to smarturl.it slash patch. It's OK. All right. And this probably will take about five minutes. Um, so dear laptoppers, go here. And those of you without a laptop, consider yourself teaching assistants. Um, you don't have to necessarily screen watch very aggressively. Uh, <laughs> Oh, wait, why? Oh, I see, yeah. Well, well. Um, so in general, the way we do this is that there's not a one-to-one -one student to teacher ratio. Uh, people walk around the room like I'm doing now and sort of like screen watch. Uh, Any other sample TAs want to stand up and just look around the room with me? Uh, it's <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm just remembering lots of workshops where that's been the problem. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. We should. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Are you? St you're still in Georgia? Right state. It's a cute town name. I forget it though. Tybee Island. Tybee Island. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Do you need help with anything? Finally, the sense of like, mm hmm, or the sense of that is hilarious. I was like, do a wiki But then, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you need help with anything? I'm sorry. Oh, you can, you, oh, I see, I see. Don't worry about it, yeah. Well, yeah, you. I would recommend just skipping that now and going to that and working through that, which you should be able to do on your Mac plane.
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Submit it. Whatever. Oh, yeah. No, you shouldn't try to do that on Chrome OS. That's not going to work. Um, yeah. People do sometimes, like, oh, is that an X40? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you should, maybe you should practice screen watching instead, Terry. Walking around looking at people's screens. Yeah, it's an extremely important skill. I'm completely serious. That's like what I'm trying to teach here. You have to simultaneously be able to look at people's screens and not just like follow into fall into a depressive mess when somebody's looking at Facebook and think like, man, this is never going to work. All of my students are just not even excited about being here. And then it turns out they just like put too many hyphens on the patch command. How are you doing? Oh, yeah? Uh, what are you trying to do? Yep, thanks. OK, great. <laughs> I see. OK, fair enough. So I'm going to bug you later and ask you about that. Great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Oh, you so don't use W, you can use curl. Yeah. Does this just work by if there's only one other file in the folder and the one yeah. that you're that was what we were that you're piping to that? Oh, actually, it's not. It recognizes it's not just based on. It's not just based on if there's another file in the folder. It is based on the name of that file. And if you look at the patch, the dot patch file, it shows you, it has a header. Oh, so it has a header that identifies the, the thing to patch. The other one. Right. Oh, yeah, cool. the patch target. It's all target. done, although submit it to where? Where am I submitting this? Oh, upload it here. So it wouldn't matter how many files were in the one. Yeah. So maybe I'll return. Wow. <laughs> um, Luris is making some great body language here. That's yeah, worth where knowing. Is my file? <laughs> it's like. I was so close to that. <laughs> it's all right. Go 
Okay. <laughs> you, I consider, yeah. Didn't it just just modify the original one? It did, but it's not Yeah, so really, the, the thing I want you all to get out of this is the idea that screen watching is not, is like actively great for your event. You should be walking around and looking at people's screens and not feel at all like you shouldn't be, because they're not there to be private, they're there to learn something. Uh, so, uh, so that, this is basically, I want to quickly summarize the, the points that I learned from Try to Copy Rails Bridge and uh, how I've integrated that into the open source comes to campus events. Um, so, you know, Jessica and I had did a bunch of work, uh, this is Jessica McKellar, setting up these events. But like I was emphasizing, what you really want, like at some point, you will look like this, where you're exhausted and you don't want to be the one organizing these events. You have put this together, this massive two-day workshop, and you need to relax. And uh, that's why I love so much this strategy of working together with the user group. And in our case, um, we can translate that and apply it to working with computer clubs or women in computer science groups at colleges that have existing organizational structures. So you can then email them a month later and encourage them to run an event. And even if you're not there, they can put it together themselves. And in the Boston Python workshop case, which was sort of the point of, of replicating it, uh, this, this, is what, this is what the results were like in San Francisco. And and perhaps with even finer tuning to the events, they would improve even more. Um, but uh, in, in Boston Python, we got some similar results. By nine months into the, doing these two workshops plus two open project nights, we, the user group was consistently 15% plus women. And that stayed that way for the past almost two years. What was the open project night? The project night is just uh, having uh, a time where people can bring their own laptops and work on whatever they want to work on. Um, and we do have, we do reserve an area called the Newcomer's Corner, which is like where people can hang out and get help. And we have a little guide for how to help them that's on the wiki, the Open Hatch wiki. Um, so what I figured out, basically, is that you need to set goals for what kind of change you want to see. And then you need to figure out some plan by which you can measure and revise these, measure your impact and then revise your plan. So. Um, uh, let me go silence that. And let me silence this whole thing. Pardon me. Uh, so in, in our case for the first open source comes to campus event, one of the measurements was how many follow-up events happened. And it was basically just the one by UV. Um, another, if it, another one that I'd like to, to start doing more and more in the future is to track the people who came to the event on GitHub and just see if they're doing things. And um, then if we have a control population in the same university, we can make statements like, people who come to our events do or don't increase in their GitHub activity and by this much. Um, we've run about seven-ish of these events so far. So we have a far sizable sample. Yeah, and if they're working on any products not on GitHub, if they're submitting patches after patches to the Linux kernel, uh, then we'll never see that, it's true. Um, but you might hypothetically believe that those kinds of hard to measure, those kinds of problems with the measurement strategy would e equally affect the control, the control pool. So what you get is a sort of a lower bound. Um, yeah, uh, so you guys all briefly saw this training mission uh, I was going to work through one of the other training missions, which is my favorite one, in which you learn how to use subversion by so-called subverting. Uh, does will this button work? No. OK. Oh, I see. Yeah, the bullets. OK. Uh, the other thing that I learned is that we started getting more and more conversation going on on this events mailing list. Uh, if you send mail here, you will be greeted by a friendly mailman. What are you doing sending email here? You need to subscribe. Uh, really, you should go to lists.openhash.org slash events. And there you will see the nicest looking, the nicest looking mailman page the world has ever known. Oh, how did you make it so pretty? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look. You mean instead of the, the, the super dopey <laughs> mailman pages? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. Uh, Sarah brought to tears by the beauty. Wow. I know. It's really amazing. Um, yeah, so basically, this is actually just a static HTML page. And all, there, there's no templating here. Can you wrap it around like a Google group? Because the Google group subscriptions that stuff, too. Uh, you, I, you could make your own landing page. But the trick here is that I just configured the web server that when it gets this URL, it actually just serves a request to this random directory with Apache alias. Um, it turns out the mailman has a bunch of built-in stuff that lets you do this, but approximately zero people in the world do. But there are, there are a couple of Wikimedia lists that are doing something similar. I think we both decided to do this around the same time. I don't know if... Oh, man. You're in for... You're in for a surprise. All right, so let's look at any other open hatch mailing list. Yeah. And even if you make it enormous, it's still That's like... How that's Mailman lists pages look yeah. all over the internet. Oh, that is that. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like totally not, not what? Friendly. They're not friendly. Yeah, I know. They're not friendly and they're everywhere. They are totally not friendly, it's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so in Mailman... <laughs> I know. Uh, the other thing is that the list admin... So uh, any list owner on any Mailman service, I think, can replace the contents of the web page with arbitrary HTML. You just have to click in the right place. But approximately zero people know this. In fact, I didn't even know this, so I reconfigured the web server instead. Uh, but that's how we can. Arbitrarily pretty. You could. You just replace the response with this page instead. Yeah, um, but you can customize the raw HTML, as I was saying, and then you could use the actual mailman templating system if you wanted to. But which is actually surprisingly easy to use. Anyway, so yeah, uh, we have some conversation on this list. In particular, the thing I wanted to talk about was that uh, before we got the event, the Boston Python workshop started, I sent a mole to a RailsBridge event, who's Karen Rustad, for those of you who know her. And she wrote up like 15 paragraphs about how the event worked, how laptop setup worked, what she did and didn't like, so that, we could, so that I, based in Boston, could clone it as effectively as possible. Uh, and now there's a lot of other traffic on the list, people starting other events and chatting about them. Um, and we also just started this thing called if, if Open Hatch Affiliated Events, where if you're running an outreach event of any kind and it's uh, sort of compatible with this idea of, um, of supporting Open Hatch's educational and community growing mission and being related to programming in open source communities, if you Edit, go to this wiki page and edit it and include a link to your event, it'll sort of grab my attention and really, really make sure I reply to your emails. And um, there's a lot of people on the mailing list that want to help you with things like publicity for your event, connecting you to other local people that they might know, um, talking about how to reflect after the event, crucially, which is something that a lot of event organizers don't remember to do, and then using that reflection to improve the next event. Uh, we also have sample text like the stuff I'm talking about here, um, that you can use to send e emails to people as they sign up if you're not using Meetup or something, which open source comes to campus, doesn't use Meetup, so we have some sample text. Um, and we also really want to help with publicity. Um, one of the super fun things about running these events is then having everyone at conferences love you and having them give you talk slots. So you should all do that too. And I can totally help you write talk proposals. Um, so yeah, uh, PyStar Philly, the Boston Python Workshop, RailsBridge Boston, and a bunch of other independently run Open Hatch affiliated events are on that wiki page, and you should consider joining also. So the next, in the 20 minutes we have, what I was planning to do is talk in more depth about the, uh, um, the particulars of the curriculum, um, and then talk about particular logistical issues that we've run into. Uh, that'll be a bit dry, but I guess it's probably a good idea because then you'll know how these events work. So let's do that. Um, maybe I'll quickly pause if anyone has any questions right now. What was the previous slide? Uh, what previous slide? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the previous slide was about uh, the, on my favorite of the Open Hatch training missions is the one that employs this pun where you learn how to use subversion 
by submitting a by proposing a patch to Mr. Bad's list of evil plans. Uh, and when he merges your patch, he gives you commit access, and then you can edit his plans while he's not looking. <laughs> and uh, that lets you see how like SVN diff works, submitting a patch, and then using SVN commit. So we do spin up a totally, you know, one subversion repo per child or something. We do spin up a repo for you uh, when you like start the mission. And the code for that breaks surprisingly infrequently. I'm kind of amazed. Um, but I think it's, I think with 20 minutes I'll probably focus on how the lectures work rather than this training mission because you can do it yourselves. Um, I have one quick question. Yeah. You were talking about uh, having to install, uh, you were installing OpenCast or something. Yeah. What actually is your app? Oh yeah. So it's a Django app, uh, currently AGPL v3 licensed. It bundles all its dependencies. The app serves up, uh, some pages on the website that help you find open source projects to work on by downloading bugs from other projects' bug trackers. The app serves up some pages that are these training missions that you saw. And those include sort of form validation to see if you got the right answer, and a bunch of custom code to give you specific hints, like if you submit a patch, if you're trying to submit a patch while learning how to use patch between two files, but you flip the order, we could tell you, like, no, you're wrong. But what would be better is if we told you, I think you reversed the patch order. Here's what you probably did. So we do that. And that's like a large number of special cases which have a test suite. So, you know, going back to the meta land, we have a virtual student used in the automated tests for a website whose purpose is to teach actual students how to, how to use open source tools through simulated interactions with open source projects so that when they actually do it, they're comfortable. Any other questions so far? Um, OK, so there's this lovely new wiki page that is actually basically complete now called OSCTC Resources on the Open Hatch Wiki. And I'll edit the session notes to have links to all these. Um, so we have a sample laptop setup guide, which is like the Boston Python Workshop one, but a little, but a little simpler. Um, We've mostly dropped the command line tutorial for Open Source Comes to Campus because we've just sh cut down the material so much that it's mostly not needed. You just need to know how to open up a terminal on your computer, be it with Git Bash or with Terminal on a Mac or GNOME Terminal or similar on a Linux system. Um, and CD and OSing around is all you need to know, really. Um, in the past, we had a session. In one of the workshops, we had a session that talked about packaging more. Not like how to make a package, but how to use the package manager on your system to find out what is installed. And uh, I think that's super useful. And I think it's actually uh, one of the best things about Linux-based operating systems. But it's not strictly required to get people to the point of submitting patches to, upstream to other projects. So we've phased it out. Um, we also, uh, you, the pen workshop started out as two days. Uh, you'll remember that the one hour tutorials we could compress down to half an hour if people practiced. So we've compressed the whole thing to two days, sorry, from two days to one day now, which also means there's some pressure to remove extraneous material. Um, so we mostly don't use the command line tutorial here, but you can use those. Um, we usually start with a lecture on open source communication tools, which talks about bug trackers, different patch, and what version control is, although not in any depth. Uh, and uh, how to use IRC, and you, usually the most fun, usually one of the most fun things that, is, that takes place during the day is the instructor having an IRC window up uh, and having students like show up and talk with each other. Um, one thing that I don't have a good solution for right now is that, I, is that IRC really makes more sense if you can read the part of the time when you weren't looking at it, um, which is to say people like me have an IRC client running somewhere on a server that we log into and then read scroll back when we uh, come back to our computers and catch up on the past day or two of conversation. It'd be super cool to be able to give people something where they could get that. Uh, I could probably ask ircloud.com or something to give out free accounts, but I'm, if you, it, it's a thing. That's a web-based thing. Yeah, we can totally run our own bouncer. I run my own Quassel core for myself. It's a shame. I run into a doctor who's problem with IRC, and it's a shame that we don't have better technology to get that to scroll back on. 
Yeah. A lot of channels are publicly logged, but not all of them. And it's, it's a completely inconsistent experience to have to read the logs and then reply to somebody in the other window. Um, well, that's why Grove.io, with their proprietary IRC-based corporate chat solution, has a web app that you can log into that gives you the history. Yeah. It does, well, yeah. Uh, un unfortunately, or something, IRC is where many of the projects are yeah. for now. <laughs> um, yeah, but we, we have detailed slides here as to what to, what to, detailed like talking points for what to say. So I'll give you a quick tour of the IRC one. Um, Uh, the version control stuff, here, this just it talks in a sentence or two about version control. Oh, okay. So nothing specific about it. Yeah. Um, and in fact, this, this one uses Wikipedia history as the quick demo. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and that's in the first 30-ish minute communication tools section. Sure. When we get to actual version control, which is a separate demo, well, so let me zoom out for a second. Uh, open source communication tools is the first teaching block. Introduction to version control shows up somewhere later. Ethics and history of free software is a discussion that shows up somewhere later. And um, so it's usually, if I recall the web page correctly, uh, mm, yeah, actually, this is where I wanted to start. OK. So you start with like introduction to open source communications tools, which is what I was just giving you a tour of. Um, a more detailed talk about version control. And this talks about Git in particular. Um, but it does so by illuminating. Uh, so I have this long collection of bullet points that make a lot of sense to read through on your own, mostly. Um, but we sort of tour people by saying, like, have you ever worked with people on group projects before? Was that great, emailing files between each other? What if there was something better? Um, and then we use, uh, I talk about, I spend more time going through Wikipedia's history, which conveniently, is very Git-like in one way, that its primary interface for history is sort of content rather than the diffs. So um, you can explain that like here is a version of a page. You can click on the previous page. You can click on these two things to see the difference. Um, here's the analogous thing using Git. Uh, and there's a handful of differences between Git and uh, Wikipedia. I'm chuckling here because for the demo at Wellesley, um, I was like, I know, we should uh, edit this page to point out that um, to point out that Wikipedia, all, on Wikipedia, all the edits show up immediately. So the first sentence says, Policy College is a highly selective private women's world liberal arts college, dot, dot, dot. But this word highly is there because I was talking about this sentence, as I recall, in the event. And people were like, well, why don't you say it's a highly selective uh, college? So I was like, OK. Uh, I'll have to go back and check the history. I think that's how, why that's there. Um, and this like caused some edit wars, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I think some Harvard person re reverted it and then based on some Harvard IP editing anonymously reverted it and then it continued. I'm going to have to go to the Mills College website and say that it's a private college. And so you can, uh, you can use this demo that, you can use this demo to show that on Wikipedia, sort of patches are merged automatically, whereas in open source projects, there's some review process. And um, so then I talk briefly about, uh, yeah, so we have this demo using the German law GitHub repo, which is a great project to see in that um, if you submit a pull request, well, how does the new GitHub work? Uh, okay. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, I just changed. Uh, I, I just opted into the new UI just before doing a demo, so that way I could confuse myself. What am I? What was I thinking? Uh, anyway, but and other things not to do. Like. Oh my god! <laughs> other things not to do include uh, having doing a deployed updated training mission during an event. Uh, I knew that was a bad idea, but then I confirmed it empirically. 
So, oh yeah, there are pull requests somewhere on the right here. Anyway, the German, this is all of German law. Um, so if you submit a pull request, they're not going to accept it automatically. There's a review process, which is like legislature. So, um, Yes. <laughs> and they approximately encourage it, actually. Um, sorry. Uh, why get? Um, yes, you are encouraged to open pull requests. I guess there's an there's a English grammar here that fix that we should submit. Um, either it should be a pull request or a plural noun. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, similarly, many open source projects exercise some degree of control over the content of the project. Um, and then we ask students to work through the Git training mission on the Open Hatch site. And if they get through that quickly, we, have, we suggest they go through try.github.io, which is a sort of more Git advanced t visual tutorial that shows you how to do a bunch of things. Uh, so that's what we say about version control. Um, we do this thing called the career panel, where we try to get professionals in open source in some way to talk for 30 minutes about their careers. Um, we try to do that for all the following reasons. I'd like the event to give the impression that open source is a like, normal thing. Uh, I'd, like to give the I'd like to give the impression that open source is a thing that you can, in fact, get paid to do. And uh, I'd like to, um, when there's a company that sponsors the event, I'd like it's great to have a way to highlight them and have them talk about what jobs they're hiring for and that sort of thing. And it also lets students see again that people, in fact, want to pay you to do this sort of thing. Do you highlight stuff like internship programs, university recruiting, that kind of stuff? Um, we certainly highlight um, Marina Zrakinskaya came to some of the most recent events and has, had us hand out a flyer about the GNOME Women's Outreach Program and Google Summer of Code. Mm -hmm. And those we definitely will keep handing out. I thought I heard you say something earlier about the differences in women in proprietary software versus open source. What, right. What, did, what was that? Uh, from, from the fig figures that I've seen, which are about 12 years old, so others may know better, uh, the percentage of women as in the proprietary software workforce is 25 or 30 or 35 ish percent. And in free software, it's depending when you measure, one ish to three ish. Uh, but it, it's, if you kind of want quantitative community management talk, you'll learn that the methodology for that 1 to 3% is somewhat confusing. Well, but it's definitely. Four of us here have jobs in open source in this room right now. Yeah. What's all <laughs> uh, quantitative community management. Where is that? 445, yeah, later today. I mean, I know that this is a substantially awesome group, but it's just kind of We need a new study. We need a new study. Awesome. Why don't we uh, talk we at lunch? lunch? Yes, or, yeah. Yeah. or soon. I have a thing at lunch, but soon. This week. I'll talk with you two at lunch. Okay. All of us. Um, Chris, Chrissy's also interested in doing that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And, and we would be talking the same. Well, now that I'm talking about studies, I'll pitch, <laughs> I'll pitch my quantitative community management talk, uh, which is taking place at 445, because there's a couple of studies that I am about to start running. Um, Yes. Because I'm free for that, and then we should all figure out what we want to have it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the long and short of it. The short and long, maybe, respectively. Um, yeah, so we, we've always managed to find sponsorship for food one way or another. Uh, sometimes that's from the computer science department that's hosting us. Sometimes it's from companies that send people to the event. Um, and... Uh, then there's this talk that typically I give called History and Ethics of Free Software. That's varied a bit over the years, but it intends to be a kind of a broad summary of a collection of stories of free software, starting with Richard Stallman wanting a printer driver's source code and being unable to modify it in like 1982, and then him flipping out and rewriting Unix. And uh, one of my favorite mini parts of that story is that the Free Software Manifesto 
was originally, in, in his manifesto about why it was so important to make all software free software, he said freeware, because he hadn't figured out this term free software yet, which just to me like speaks volumes about how these terms are fluid and ever changing. Um, but anyway, so we, um, we also do a demo of how to do a pull request, which tries to sort of take the individual learning people did with the Git training mission, where they submit a patch to a web form and make it more, more visual. This is also one of the more fun parts of the day, usually, because we have people submit pull requests against like readme files by adding their names to it. And they like Git clone, and they get a lot of help from TAs to set the Git remotes properly, which we talk about in IRC also, so they have a place to copy the commands from. And then uh, when they do a push, GitHub's web page for pull requests automatically updates. So then people say, say things like, hey, who's Julie 593? And Julie 593 in the room raises her hand. Um, and people like chuckle about the crazy pull request they submitted to like degram, degram, agrammatify or lolcatify these, these documents. Um, and then we, for two and a quarter hours or so, do the project's time part of the day where we've handpicked a bunch of bite-sized bugs and open source projects that seem actually approachable. There's a bunch of work that goes on before this to make that list, and even before that, we have, we're like slowly rolling out a thing. Slowly rolling out is a euphemism for we have a plan, but we don't do it as often as we should. Uh, for talking with open source projects weeks before and getting them to not just tag easy bugs in the bug tracker, but tag like super duper easy bugs that are usually things as simple as string fixes, or test this thing and make sure that it does the, that make sure this fix actually fixed the problem. Um, this is the part of the day where we most desperately need TA support uh, because people are working on all sorts of random open source projects. Uh, we try to, when collecting the, when planning the list of staffers for the event, um, we have this term software whisperer, which is someone who can do things like look at git push crashing and be like, oh, I can see what's going on here. Uh, you're pushing to an HTTP URL which is invoking libcurl, and you must have two different versions of it installed, and there must be an ABI incompatibility, but the linker didn't catch it, so it said fault had been running. If you switch your Git remote to SSH base, then it'll work fine, and then it does. That was my favorite recently. And um, yeah, so Software Whisperer is nice. You don't, most people don't have crazy, crazy problems, so like general people who are comfortable with programming are pretty helpful. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and then we do a bit of wrap up. Uh, we open too many browser tabs. We no. Yes, right. Yeah. So in the half hour at the end of the day, we try to ask people to talk about the ways they succeeded, the things that they got done, and. We spend a bunch of time handing out flyers, talking about follow-up events at either the computer club or, um, in some cases, if they're in Boston or something, tell them to come to a Boston Python project night if there's one of those events going on soon, uh, which has actually worked pretty well. Um, and I am totally scrolling in the wrong place of this page, but with five minutes, I'm not going to take care of that. The important thing to know is that this page has everything you could need to know, we think. And if not, then... Uh, tell me, and we'll improve it in terms of curriculum. In terms of logistics, there's a couple of key things I want to talk about. Um, the big one is how do you find and pick volunteers? And in general, my strategy for these events has been so far uh, talk with the student computer club, find one by doing Google searches like site colon whatever.edu space Linux, site colon whatever.edu space computer club or ACM or women in computer science and find a student group host that might be interested or if you're lucky have them email you and then uh, find one or two preferably two local contacts who's willing to do things like find a room with you uh, make sure the interaction with the university works out fine and having two contacts is super useful because people get busy uh, it's also really good if those contacts are willing to actually come to the event in the past, we ran an event uh, at Harvard where we accidentally scheduled it for a three-day weekend. And so both of the 
both of our student, one, both our student contacts had other commitments so they couldn't make it. And in hindsight, that should have been a red flag. Uh, we should have picked a weekend where our, our contacts could have come. And it turned out that we had really low attendance because people signed up and then realized that actually they were going home for that three-day weekend. Or there was like some three-day intensive training program for some other student group they were involved in that popped up. Um, so yeah, when you're picking your date for the event, talk with your contacts and then really press them. We have a list on the logistics section uh, that is linked to here um, about three-day weekends. Yeah, holidays and three-day weekends are bad news. Um, summer is not great, but possible. We'll find out soon, I guess. We're running one in Boston this Saturday and running, running one in San Francisco uh, in a week and a half. Uh, well, the sign up website. You later. I, I was going to ask you whether I could come to one in San Francisco sometime soon. And just the sign up website, I see, it looks like this. So Saturday, June 29th. And the, the code for this website is like just a bunch of static HTML again, and you can fork it and make it your own if you're running another event. Um, and I think if you make this page super large and the people photos become bigger, I'm not sure how web pages work, so maybe that doesn't happen. Uh, but um, in terms of staffers, so one approach is to wait until you have the date set and then email a bunch of people you think might possibly help. And then you might get disappointed and frustrated that most of your staffers can't make it because they made other plans between when you started planning the event and when you knew when it was. So a different thing you can do is what I've started doing, which is what I call priming volunteers, where you send them all emails however long in advance you want. And you're like, hey, you're a nice person. Here's the kinds of things we do. If I told you when these events were, uh, would you be willing to tell me if you can make it? And then they're already familiar with it. Um, we send a lot of mass emails. I really like sending mass emails from the command line. I have this script that uh, is a fork of someone else's script called Python Mailer, where this I'm going to show you because I love it so much. And that'll be almost the end of time. OK. So you're in this Git repo, and there are some files. Uh, and if you need to contact people, you just put their info into a CSV. Oh, I probably shouldn't be showing all these email addresses in the recording. Uh, anyway, and uh, with these names in the, in the CSV, you just make a file called .html. That's your text. It's .html because I didn't finish updating something, but it has to be .html. It's not that important. Um, here's what will happen. Uh, do you want to come be at our event? And then you run Python. What is the Python script here? Um, uh, yeah, pymailer.py. Um, if you run it in test mode, what? OK. Yeah, if you replace the S with the T, it'll run it in test mode and send it only to you first. And then with hyphen S, it'll mass mail all the people in the CSC file. And because I'm weird, I find this easier than like typing things into a Email, edit, email thing, uh, and BCCing everyone. But it's also nice because you can personalize it. Um, so it'll say, hi, name, comma. Yes, I love this. Uh, and no one will know unless they read the headers. Uh, and I could forge those headers even better, and then they really won't know. So uh, I love sending mass emails. I think that that's. Um, there's other logistics-y things to consider. We have sample email templates that you can use for sending out these emails to both staffers and attendees. Um, but I think I have negative three minutes left, so I should ask if you guys have any questions. We don't typically. Um, we're lucky to have corporate sponsorships and either for the program as a whole or for individual events that make them possible. The costs for the event are some background cost of staff time plus food at the event and travel when necessary to get to the event. And we've done okay at, for not charging students. Um, one thing I will say is that for the Boston Python workshop, our attendee like percentage, our 
whatever your anti no show rate is. Anyway, our no show rate is reasonably low. Inversely, our attendance rate is very high. Um, and I think that has to do with the fact that it's an opportunity, not just like a random event. And for those and for these, we don't charge. OK, bye. Any other questions? Yes, we do. Um, and we, in the logistics section, um, we have this section, general purpose publicity, where we have email templates to send out to, for example, uh, at least other science departments or other professors who have classes that seem relevant. And sort of some to illuminate through non-statistically significant anecdotes, uh, our most excited student at Hopkins was a bio major, I think, and was interested in hacking on BioPython because she was, had heard about it and ended up work going back and forth with the maintainers on this pull request to remove some dead code and then I stuck with it for a few weeks and it landed. So, plenty, yeah. Cool, thanks. I will keep sitting here for a minute or two.